Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, Phil. Um, I'm sure that many of you would have preferred that Annie continued singing uh, rather than have me here, and I certainly would, but I was lucky she did stop because I ran out of tissues. It was such a moving uh, testimony and the music was so great, I had to recompose myself to come up here and, and speak. But I congratulate the organisation here for doing such a great job and to encouraging this uh, convention on the Eucharist. And I'm delighted to actually to be here and to be able to share with you some really great uh, stories that um, have come about through the work that Mike Willisie and I have been doing in the area of science and faith. And I'm going to um, give you a bit of insight into the, the making of the program Science from God and the filming of the Stigmata and then proceed on to two very interesting new cases that I don't think any of you know about uh, which involves two Eucharistic miracles that we've been working on and the stories there will have ramifications for the church and I believe for science and I'll come to that. But let me just say at the outset how nice it is to see such a group of um, fellow Christians spending time at an event like this and taking time off from doing things that the rest of the world out there are doing like enjoying your lovely beaches, uh, following that other religion that you all have over here called rugby isn't it? Um, or even uh, having watching a replay of last night's wedding. But I'm sure that the reason why you do that is because you believe in God, he's part of your life and that's not the case with everyone. I mean when you think about it how many millions and millions of people who live in this world who really have no consciousness of God or somehow or other God's been pushed right away out of their, out of their mind. But yet every one of those people I'm sure at some point in their lives do stop and think about those big questions. How did life begin? Is there any purpose to our life? And what happens to us after our death? And we, traditionally we have looked, at, looked to religion to try and gain answers to those big questions. But today science it seems has stepped in and has offered its explanation for these big questions. And of course we know how much science has advanced in the last hundred years. We know now that science has progressed in, in many fields. At one extreme with the invention of the telescope they can look into the heavens and explore the universe in, in ways that could never have been imagined before. At the other extreme they can look into a microscope into the tiniest particle into a cell and they find that in that cell is a world of its own an incredibly complex organized uh, piece of information that is greater than the greatest computer that's ever been conceived and it's in digital technology it's just an, um, an amazing world inside that cell and so science it seems has gained this confidence to be able to assert their ability to answer the big questions so much so that now we listen to them when they tell us that there are other explanations to our existence other than for God. And you can imagine how much how difficult it is for a school, stu school student today who attends a school like this or any school anywhere on earth who goes into the science class and is now told that we are the product of a big bang that there was an explosion in the universe billions of years ago which led to the conditions favorable for a molecule to form and to replicate and become more complex eventually form a cell that involved that then evolved into more complex forms and ultimately we arrive after having trans transferred through the species of an ape and yet that's that's what they encourage you to think and in fact there are people who walk around now saying that God is a delusion that we can see in nature such such ability to be able to self-create that anyone who doesn't believe in the scientific process of evolution or natural selection is in the dark ages and that child now comes out of his science class walks into a religion class and he's told that God created the world that he created you in his image that you are the pick of his creation that your life has purpose that there is that there is life after death and that if you have done all those things that you are supposed to do that you're entitled to a paradise in heaven afterwards and for the the Catholic school, school student he's got a bigger dilemma because 
He's then confronted with the teaching of the Catholic Church, which says that that God who created the world, that God who created you, is in fact inside a piece of bread. As the Americans call it, where's Annie? They call it a cookie or something, don't they? You're not, a get a, not exactly going to be first invitee to the intellectual's party with beliefs that you believe God's in a cookie. And of course that's the essential element, the, the fundamental belief of the Catholic faith. And it's a very difficult concept. And it's a concept that I think that is becoming harder and harder for Catholics to comprehend. But in the stories I'm going to tell you tonight, you are going to have some relief from that dilemma, that problem. And they are great stories. But let me just tell you that 20 years ago I could never have imagined I'd be travelling all the way over here and speaking to you about God. I would be happy to talk to you about the planning system in New South Wales, the, the powers of government to confiscate property without compensation, all those sort of great questions. And I was good at it. I earned a lot of money telling people what I thought about those things. But it all changed one day when, um, in 1987, sitting in my office, and a priest comes in and says to me, look, uh, will you help me? He says, um, the, b the bishop has just appointed me to this area. I need to get a church and school going. He says, but I, I haven't got any money. Um, my parish hasn't got any money. We've got no land. I'm thinking, what else? I'm well, expecting a donation. He wants a donation. And so, oh, no, no, no. He says, no, no, I don't want any money from you. He says, I've got, I've got it all worked out. He says, I saw this piece of land and I've been there each morning and I've been kneeling down saying, praying to God that one day we might get it. He says, then I went and got a, a relic of Mary MacKillop. And of course, I think you New Zealanders all believe in Mary MacKillop, don't you? <laughs> I think she's a saint for you as well, isn't she? Well, anyhow, this is the days before she was a saint. So he got a relic of Mary MacKillop, nailed it up on the tree, and he says, that's where it's going to be. I looked at him and I said, Father, let me get this right. You've got no money. Your parish has got no money. You've got no land. Um, you, um, you don't know who owns the land you've been praying on, you don't know how big it is, and, you got, and I said, uh, things aren't going very well for you. And I said, maybe that's the way they did conveyancing back in the Middle Ages. I need to know, you know, I need to know all these things. And I can see he was getting a bit upset that I wasn't helping him very much, because I really didn't know how to help him, but anyhow. So I got out the zoning map and I looked at the map and he showed me where the land was and I said, oh, Father, it's the wrong zone anyhow, so forget about it. So uh, I said, but let me think about it. There may be some other thoughts I can put to this problem and see if there's land elsewhere that could be zoned. So he wanders off. The next day I have a new client walk into my office. He says, look, will you um, help me? Will you act for me? I want to market a piece of land that I have. He, yeah, I know, you're getting it. Uh, he says, um, I need to sell this land in a hurry because for tax purposes, if I can get it before the end of the financial year, I have great benefits. And, uh, and lo and behold, you're not going to guess, it's exactly where the relic was. And so, and the, the story now, it's a long story, I'm not going to go through it now, but if you go there today, you'll see there's a great big school there, there's a new church. Every bit of what he prayed for happened without one cent. It's a long story. But afterwards I said to him, Father, um, I said, Father, when you kneeled on the ground and you prayed and you, you know, you have three university degrees, you kneel down like a peasant, you look up to the sky, talk to a God you can't see, you ask for the impossible and it happens. How do you explain that? And he said, well, he says, you know, he says, the God who made this world hasn't gone to sleep, you know. He says, um, he says I work for him and, I, and he has to do his job, you know. <laughs> so he said, well, okay, that sounds reasonable enough. So he, to him it was, it was no problem because he believed that God was there, that he would help him. He was in a dilemma and he expected it from him and it happened. And so I was there right in the middle of this incredible story. I mean, I, I don't know how many lawyers there must be in Australia or New South Wales, but how coincidental I get one bloke turning up one day, then the other one the next day, both in front of me, and this thing happens. But it made me think, you know, um, when you pray, does God listen to your prayers? Does he act in this way? Is he an interventionist God? You know, it's hard enough for people to believe that there's a God, let alone that he can step in and do things for you, and this is what seemed to be happening. So I thought, well, I'll have a look and try and study this scientifically. Is this coincidence, miracle? How do people explain miracles? Do they really happen? And if they really do happen, how can there be atheists around if this really happens? Why this divide? So I began researching 
the famous miracle of Fatima in, in Portugal in 1917. And to me, that was an incredible story. It still is. It's, it's hard to believe that something so momentous could have happened with so many witnesses, obviously a sign from God. No one ever talks about it. And yet it had to do with finding peace on earth. I then began to read the lives of the saints. And um, I, then I realized that in the lives of the saints, the sort of thing that I'd experienced with this priest were almost commonplace. Read the story of the Cure of Ars, read the story of Padre Pio. In fact, Padre Pio became a very good um, subject for me, my reading, because I couldn't believe that there existed a person in 1968 who had such obvious signs that God was uh, acting through him. And I'd never heard of the stigmata before, that it was a real event, a real thing. And also I began to read some of the, the writings of mystics, like um, St. Catherine of Siena, and I thought, this is unusual. Why don't people ever talk about this? That the church actually recognizes that God can speak to a human being and impart to them information which for the good of humanity. This is after the time of the apostles. And the work that they receive in dictation from Jesus becomes part of the literature of the church and they get marked as doctors of the church. To me, that seemed uh, an in incredible story. And I thought to myself, would it be, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it have been nice to have Lexi lived at the time of Catherine of Siena, to have been in the room when Jesus was speaking to her, that you could examine her, that you could you know, form your own opinion rather than relying upon what's given to you historically? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I actually had those, have had those opportunities. They're remarkable. Many of them have documented. Some of them are, I actually record in the book Reason to Believe. And I haven't got time, I know there's a time creep around here somewhere going to watch my time, so I've got to be careful about getting the important things down. But these stories were real, and, and, and it was this type of subject matter that I was speaking to Mike Willisy about. Mike was um, a neighbour of mine, a um, friend, I was also his lawyer, and I discussed some of these stories that I'd been examining, like the stigmata, and he said, and he said, look, Ron, he said, I've done stories like this over the years, there's no such thing as a miracle. They're all hoaxes. And I said, well, I said, you are a journalist who prides in the fact that you make pronouncements about what you believe based upon an examination of evidence. But here you're making a pronouncement of negativity about the story of the stigmata without looking at the evidence. How many other stories have you done like this? You know? And so I said, why don't you go and prove me wrong? So he was an ex Catholic, very hostile against the church, but he took up the challenge because um, he had in his essence that true journalism, which is to say, okay, this, a lot of consequences follow if this story is true. A lot of consequences follow if it's false. Either way, it's a great story. And so he took up the challenge. And so, and when a friend of his in the Fox Network, who actually grew up with him in early television, heard that he was going to uh, do a story on this claim that I had believed in, that there's a current person who was experiencing the stigmata. They said to Mike, would you be prepared to film what you investigate? And he thought it was a great idea. So we then lined up a, a time to go and meet a person I'd been studying. And, um, and she had had the experience of the stigmata a few times, and usually on a Friday. So we thought, well, let's go over there Good Friday, which is... Um, uh, you know, the time when Jesus died on the cross, maybe if he's going to have the stigmata, it'll happen on that day. So we get there with film crews from America, and we get there and um, we start to question her. She says, yes, I'm happy to be filmed when I have it, but uh, I don't know if I'm going to have it today. And then Jesus apparently speaks to her and said, Jesus says to me, I won't have the stigmata today, but I'll have it on the day after the feast of Corpus Christi, which was two months away. That was very interesting. I know that people might say, oh, why would, if God was talking, why would he send you all the way back to Australia and then make you come back again, all that cost? But it was a very interesting technique or ploy that was being used because what we were able to do is actually film the prediction of an event. If it happened, that would be an amazing historical fact that you could film someone predicting a supernatural event in advance. So we filmed the prediction. The prediction essentially was that two months' time, the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi, that she would have the stigmata. It would start around about 12. 
you go through the experience of the pain and suffering of Christ in the hands and the feet, and then at three it would subside, and the next day it would be gone. That was the prediction. So when the Fox Network heard that this was on the go, she said, well, we've got a great story here, because if this doesn't happen on that day, we've got a, a fraud. So there was a big thing hanging on that. So we come back on the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi, in fact the day before, two cameras, seven witnesses in a room. And um, let's see if I can play this thing now. Tell me if I'm doing it right. Is there something coming up? No? What do I, what do I have to do to get this thing to work now? Uh, okay. Okay. Well, there you see the um, scene from the program. But we go there on the day, and um, we were there before 12 with two cameras, nine witnesses. And the cameramen, the people, got no belief in God, or they're just doing a duty there for 60 minutes. Um, and uh, so we are watching. She, at 12, around about 12 ish, wounds start appearing on the head as if from the crown of thorns. Um, they're the first ones. They just started to appear in front of us. Ultimately, subsequently, when we had a, um, an expert pathologist look at them who would, and we told him no um, explanation as to what they were, he said, those injuries look like thorn marks or uh, marks that you'd get if a person had fallen out of a car into bushes because you see the perforations into the skin from tiny plant particles. He says, that's the, that's the impression I get from looking at that. So there those appear in front of us. Then progressively, you can see there, there's nothing, and the times are on the top there, 12, 26, 38 seconds. You just see the, the beginnings of something. And then it begins to appear progressively. And you can see it's like a form of a cross that was there. That appeared by itself. And then ultimately, the wounds became larger. Um, and deep. You can see there that, that footmark. In fact, when that was being filmed, you could actually see the blood oozing out of the skin, and the perforation was almost in a perfect circle, as if, and you could almost measure the diameter of that circle. But those wounds formed in, in harmony with each other, both feet at the same time, same intensity, and the undersides of the feet, the same with the hands. People, people, many people have gone to print after seeing this program and commented about it. Oh, and they said, look, it's mind over matter. She did it to herself. Well, we take the argument she did it to herself. How could she fool ten witnesses and two cameras that she did it to herself without anything in her hands? How could she do it in all those places? Something happens. The explanation is not that she did it to herself. Some people say, well, you know, maybe the, 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 the power of mind over matter. In the literature you'll find that there are some instances where under hypnosis some people have been able to create marks on their body. But there's no information in any literature that I've been able to find where someone who is not under hypnosis can predict in advance that they can make appear in their body wounds which um, mimic the wounds of Christ for them to appear from nothing, for them to form harmoniously, for them to progress and then ultimately to subside within a time span between 12 and 3. That is unique. If anyone anywhere in the world can produce a person who can make that prediction and make that happen, we'll be the first on a plane to go and find it and, and uh, examine it. But we are witnesses to this incredible story. It actually happened. The explanations of self-manipulation, the explanations of... of, um, of uh, hypnosis, just aren't the answers. And yet, what we say, 30, 40 million people have seen this film, not one critic has rung us up and said, can we speak to any of the witnesses? Can we see any of the raw footage? And I suppose the reason why I feel this is the sort of thing that should be ventilated and discussed is because often there are stories that do happen in our history that prejudice prevents a full knowledge and understanding of what's happened. Because if there was a genuine concern 
about this story, then you'd approach it scientifically. You'd ask for the information, speak to the witnesses, try and understand it. Because you're only left with one possible explanation after you've exhausted all the natural ones, that it may well be that God is trying to show through this person his passion. And in fact, part of this person's story is that Jesus does dictate to her profound theology. And I've been present while it's happened, I've filmed while it's happening. It's an amazing story. But what is really great about it is the explanations as to why he's allowed man to see his passion are clearly given in one of the, one of the books that she wrote, which is on the passion. So uh, we were witnesses to that story. It, it changed Mike Willis's life. But yet, oddly enough, to be, to be people who report on this story, people want to burn the messenger because they say, we don't want to hear this story. You're mad if you believe in this stuff. But yet all we can do is present the evidence. I don't know whether that presenting evidence like this is a, an immediate pathway to lunacy. Please, if anyone sees any evidence of lunacy here today, tell me. <laughs> but that was a, they, they are facts. That's what happened. Um, you can see we took, wound, uh, we took samples of the blood. It was obviously her blood. And um, then the, the, there it progresses. Then the following morning, the, those wounds, which anyone who's a, a medical person amongst you will know that with wounds of the size that she was demonstrating at 3 p.m. on that particular Friday, by the next morning had disappeared. If someone can make wounds appear somehow or other, how do they make them disappear? This is the next question. So that, that, that is an interesting story. The, here are some instances where we've actually filmed the writing of her uh, theological writings. Often I've been there. She starts with a blank page and begins to write um, line after line, sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, without pausing, without taking a moment to think. It, 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 the writing is continuous. When you look at it, you say, the intelligence behind this writing is not the intelligence of the person with the pen. Many examples that I could demonstrate that that is the case, but we haven't got time here now. Um, okay, now... <coughs> All right, I want to now go on to the, the story of two Eucharistic miracles that we've been studying. This is the case of Buenos Aires, Argentina, 1996. Um, the story is that a priest who was conducting Mass on the 18th of August, 1996, in Buenos Aires, at communion time, a person came up and said, look, I've just seen someone drop a communion host in a candle holder at the side of the church. So the priest stops handing out communion, goes over, picks it up, he notices it's dirty. it's dirty. So he tells the Eucharistic minister to go and get a bowl of water, put it in the water, put it in the back of the tabernacle and lock it, which he did. 25th of August, uh, seven or eight days later, uh, the Eucharistic minister goes to see if the host is dissolved. Normally what happens as part of the church protocol is that if a host... Uh, falls on the floor, the priest will normally consume it. But if it's dusty, he will allow it to, uh, he will uh, uh, put it into water, allow it to dissolve, and then pour it down a special sink that is used to wash the, the vessels from Holy Communion. And so uh, they put the host in water hoping it would dissolve. And, but when they went there a week later, opened the tabernacle, this is what they saw. You can see that the host is just visible. But the, um, there's a red substance was coming from the side of it. So they arranged for a, um, a professional photographer to photograph it on that first day. And you can see there in that side view, the host is quite visible, but yet there's this red substance surrounding it. Then they, they moved it, locked it up, and put it into a, a tabernacle in the presbytery of the church. Then a week later, they filmed, photographed again the, the, the um, the, the transformation, and you'll need to notice there that the host is beginning to dissolve more and more red substance is coming. And from that side view, you can see quite a, a, a dense form of redness um, and the host completely disappeared. In 1999, we were given permission to do a scientific examination of the, um, of the substance. We began by interviewing the priests involved with the story, the Eucharistic minister, um, 
and then we were able to take a tiny piece of the a piece of it away for examination. That's what it looked like in 5th of October 99 when we went there to take a sample. Um, the uh, piece was a piece was severed from it. There you see the tiny piece put into a test tube. It was then sealed. It was labelled. And then the first place we went to was a forensic laboratory in uh, California. Um, they, their job there was to try and see if they can find any DNA, DNA profile. <clears throat> they found that the substance had the presence of human DNA but wouldn't yield the profile of the person from whom it came. I'll come back to this point a little bit later because that lack of an answer may be an answer and I'll explain that in a moment. We then arranged for a section of it to be for it to be sectioned by a pathologist and for it to be examined. And we brought it to a forensic pathologist in New York, who is a um, uh, he's an associate professor at Columbia University, an author of a textbook on histopathology, who is a forensic pathologist and in particular a heart specialist. And he looks down the microscope of this slide, and we didn't purposely didn't tell him anything about the origin of it. I mean, it's interesting when you go somewhere and you just say, I'm a lawyer working on a case, I've got a journalist working there, well, they get the impression that it must be a forensic case. So I don't really add any more to that. I say, look, it's important, we can't tell you what it's about, it's an important case. So they always think, oh, it must be a criminal matter, you see. So otherwise, you go there and tell them it's from, in fact, this is interesting, we did go to a place in Germany trying to get a DNA examination of this, and uh, it was one of the best DNA labs uh, told, we were told in the world. And we flew to Germany especially to see if they would do a DNA examination of it. And um, they wouldn't take the case on unless we told them what the origin. So Mike looked at me, I looked at him, I thought, well, do we do we not? We'll take a risk on it. So we told them. And they said, no way, we, we're not going to touch that. I said, why not? He said, well, if you're right, we have to close down half this university because we have faculties dedicated to atheism here. You know, the story of evolution, all this stuff. So, you know, you talk about prejudice. Here is a like world famous laboratory afraid to examine something in case the answer doesn't they don't like the answer. Anyhow, we didn't tell this gentleman anything about this case. And he's looking down that microscope. We're patiently waiting for him because he's an old gentleman. He's fiddling around there, thinking maybe there's nothing there. And then he comes out with it. He says, I can tell you exactly what this is. This is flesh. This is part of the muscle of the heart. It's the muscle that gives the heart its beat and the body its life. He says, there are white blood cells infiltrating this tissue. You can see all those little dots here. He says, those white blood cells should not be there they go to address trauma. He says, those white blood cells tell me two things. One, that this heart was alive at the moment this sample was taken because the white blood cells cannot exist outside a living body. And secondly, that this heart has suffered trauma. The blood supply prevents... He says, this heart has been injured. And then he goes on to say this. He says, this is the sort of injury I see in cases where someone has been beaten around the chest. Now imagine that, we've got a, a piece of the Eucharist being examined under a microscope and this man is telling us a forensic picture which mimics the passion of Christ in that Eucharist. Um, so it's, it's an amazing story. Um, it, um, it's one that anyone can um, verify by looking at this slide. That's normal heart muscle which is unaffected by trauma and yet the white blood cells and the different look indicates that the heart has been suffering. The, um, the next case I want to deal with is um, this, this finding of heart in the Eucharist is not unique. Back in the ninth century in Lanciano in Italy, many of you are probably aware of the famous or classic case in Catholic literature of a Eucharistic miracle in Italy in, in a place called Lanciano where in that case, and by the way, here's, these are slides where the, the doctor was actually showing us the place from the heart where that muscle came. And so, so in the ninth century, 
the priest was consecrating mass. He didn't believe in the transubstantiation, so the story goes. But during the time of the elevation, the bread turned to flesh and the wine to blood. That was what was believed and it was not verified until 1970 when Professor Linoli in Italy from the University of Siena did tests on this then would have been seven, would have been what, 1200 year old sample. He found also that it was flesh and blood, human, and the, the flesh was part of the muscle of the heart. The same muscle as we found in the case in Argentina. Now, if you think this is a hard enough story to tell anyone, God has, it seems, given us an extra aid to be able to tell the story because only last year did we find about this extraordinary case in Poland. In a place called Sokolka in Poland, the story is almost like a replica of what happened in Buenos Aires. And we went there last year to um, get information about this story and, uh, and in a, in next month we will go back and actually film the entire story. But the facts were that um, while the priest was handing out communion in, in church, host dropped on the floor, rather than consume it, he put it into a bowl of water. You can believe it or not, seven days later they notice that the host begins to bleed. There's the priest, Here's, here he is showing to us the sample. There it is there. You can see what happened was that they, when the, uh, they actually poured the content from a receptacle onto a, uh, an altar cloth or a cloth, allowed it to dry, and what you see there is the product of, the, of the, what, what had dried out on the cloth. There it is a bit closer. So um, the, 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 the priests then arrange for the sample to be examined by two professors at the University of Ballastock, two, two professors of science, each of them with 30 years experience. When you look on the internet, you see that these two professors have pages and pages of papers on scientific matters that they've dealt with. They're not novices, they are people who know what they're doing. And their results are quite extraordinary. There they are telling us what they found. And this is what they found, that the substance com was completely composed of heart muscle, that it was human, that it, was, uh, it, was, it had been living, that there was damage to the tissue, and that there was evidence of rapid spasms of the heart muscle just before death. And they said that if you had to take that sample which was living to give it to us, the person who, from whom it came would have had to have died because you can't take one centimetre of living heart muscle out of a body without the person dying. That's amazing. But the, the one thing that they said that when I asked them the question, is it possible that someone could have manipulated this story? And they said the telling factor for us was that when we looked at this heart muscle under the microscope, we could see that interlaced between the fine fibres of the muscle were fibres of the host, so perfectly integrated into the muscle that no human being could do something so minuscule that you have to see it under a microscope to form that picture. Uh, an, an incredible story. And in fact, the, um, one of the professors uh, in writing on this, uh, on this story wrote, I'd like to stress that testing of the host was the most momentous research task which I've ever performed in my entire life. If I were not to perform any other research task, this would be still the most important one to me. I could not imagine that trying to explain something so extraordinary, something so impossible from a scientific point of view, would be part of my scientific experience. To us it was the most wonderful event that ever could happen to an ordinary human being. Not bad from my two Polish professors. And then in, in, in the context of that interwork way, the, the weaving of the tissue in the muscle, they said, one of them said, please believe me that if someone intended to tamper with this sample, it would be impossible to bind the two pieces of matter in such an indissol indissolvable way. So it's, the, these three cases are incredible contributions, I think, to, to the world today. 
there's similarities in the three of them. Three of them, I mean, this bread is not transformed on the way home from the supermarket. In each case, there is a similar set of circumstances. It's happened in a Catholic mass. It's happened in a way that the, the, the residue has defied scientific explanation. There's one thing I missed when I was telling you about the white blood cells in the Argentina case. The sample had been... Perfect. So f there's something happening in each case that defies science in terms of the preservation of the material. In each case, it's heart muscle. It's the same muscle of the heart. In each case, and certainly in the two cases of Poland and, 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 and Argentina, the heart has actually suffered. And that's another um, confirmatory factor. Science can't explain how this happened, and yet it happened. There's no book you can go to in the library, a science book, that will tell you how such a thing could happen. But we all know what book you can go to to give you a clue about this, uh, this, this phenomenon. There's only one book I know that was written 2,000 years ago where they talked about bread and wine becoming body and blood. And it, to me, is a very powerful argument for the validity of the Bible that can predict a scientific event that only happens in our times that can be confirmed by modern science. But even a bigger question arises because what now do we have to what what now does science say about something that contravenes so radically our laws of of uh, of science of um, biology we've actually got an undermining of one of the foundations of the rules of science particularly in biology that from inanimate matter we have got human life you can imagine the implications that's going to have, and that's the subject of a book that I'm currently writing, which is on the impact of these two stories for science and the origins of life. But um, I just realised my, my papers are getting all wet. I don't know whoever's trying to sell water here must have been selling defective products, because <laughs> I, I think I only give him a dollar ninety-eight for that water. Part of it's missing. <laughs> It's all over here. Sorry to, to diverge on that. Um, okay. Also, you know, this, this is an, for, that, for the priests amongst us, this must be so reassuring to think that there's only one person on earth that can bring about this event. In each case, it was a priest who was able to bring life from non-life in the context of those miracles, those Eucharistic miracles, reinforcing the power of the priesthood. But you know, I'd like to go back just briefly to the finding of heart. It's an, inc a a an amazing story that I think that God should allow in our time this insight into, into the, uh, the Eucharist. It comes at a time, I think, that, um, the, the, that's, that the Eucharist is really undersold. Um, if we look at the, the church's teachings, we know that, that during the Mass, at the time of the consecration, when the, the bread and wine is offered, it becomes the body and blood of Christ. And we're taught that it's not symbolic, it's real, that Jesus becomes really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's as if Jesus is there in person, um, and when you think about the magnitude of that, who is this Jesus? The creator of the universe, the one who created you, the one who sustains your life, the one who will meet you at, the, at, the, at your death and determine whether you are eligible to enter into his kingdom. And if you are, he will crown you as a king and give you the inheritance of the kingdom that he promises. But yet he humbles himself to come in the form of a piece of bread, so that during this life you can win him over for that judgment. It's, th these miracles, I think, give us an incredible uh, bolster in our, in our belief in what the church teaches about the real presence. 
And it comes at a time when I think there is such a little belief in it because when you look at the number of people who go to Mass who are Catholics, they couldn't possibly be aware of what they're missing. I know in my own parish where I live, we have 6,000 Catholics nominally, and only 600 go to Mass, which is 10%. I think that's pretty much the case in most parishes. That means 90% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. Because if they did, there would be traffic jams going to Mass. I mean, you think about it, that you can go there, speak to Jesus, and he says, I'm there till the end of time. You know, I, I speak about this, and it sounds, sounds too good to be true in many ways. But one day, I actually, not, not putting it to the test, there's a friend, there was a friend of mine who was a, a journalist who was out of work, been out of work for six months, a lapsed Catholic. And um, he was talking about how hard it was to get a job. And I said, look, I tell you what, I can guarantee you can get a job. And what? Yeah, he said, yeah, look, go to an the nearest Catholic church, kneel before the tabernacle, believe that Jesus is there and say to him, if you give me a job, I'll stand up for you. I promise you that. And if you did that, you would get a job because no one does that. He's been looking for someone to do that. Well... This bloke was so desperate, he did. <laughs> a lapsed Catholic goes there. I'm not going to identify who he is. He's on television today. I won't tell you who he is. And it's not Mike Willis. He? And he's kneeling there. And, and Sorry, he, I, so I said, go and do that. I can guarantee you get a job because no one does that. And Jesus is he's alive. He's there. He's looking for it. He's waiting for someone to come and do that. I can guarantee it. I that because of what I've experienced. Wouldn't it be good to be able to ring up a journalist and say, hey, treat seriously these cases. Give them a decent go. Don't shortchange the world on the evidence of these stories. Because if they're presented for their truth, they can transform this world. That was going through my mind. So he goes there and um, he did it. He came back the next day and he says, Ronnie says, you were right. I went there. I said that prayer. And do you know that last night I got a job in radio and television that afternoon? You know, and then, of course, he, he thinks, you know, you were right, Ron. And then, of course, he gets the job and then, oh, yeah, maybe it was coincidence, you know. Maybe it was just time for them, you know. <laughs> you, you know it's, hard, it's hard for him to win. It's hard for God to win these, these battles. But, uh, but it was, for me, a, another bolster in my um, um, confidence in being able to assert that Jesus is there, he's lonely there, he's waiting for someone to turn up. And, in fact, he'll give him almost anything you ask for, particularly if it's for him. And I think that that's the problem we have now, is that there is such a, a lack of belief in the real presence and, and the belief that when Jesus said he would remain with us until the end of time, that he would do that in the Eucharist. Now, tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow, you're going to see the Eucharist documentary, which was made as a product of these thoughts and the ambition to try and change people's attitude about how they view the Eucharist. I know they're going to give me the roundup in a minute, but I want to just give you a sneak preview of something else that's going to be very interesting to you. This whole story of the heart, the suffering of the heart, is something which merges into the concept of the, the, uh, the um, sacred heart devotion and the divine mercy devotion. If Jesus, through this Eucharist, is showing to us his heart, that it suffers, we know that the heart is a symbol of love. We know that the suffering that he suffers is reflecting our ingratitude, is reflecting our lack of reciprocation of the love that he shows us. And uh, the whole concept of the divine mercy devotion, which is to acknowledge his passion, which was to empathize with what he went through in return for his mercy, is part of the way I believe that you um, console the, the suffering heart of Jesus. There's a lot, I think, that theologians and priests will be able to draw from these Eucharistic miracles, which demonstrate the love of God and the suffering, he, the suffering in the Eucharist that ties in with the, the um, divine, mercy, divine Mercy Devotion and the Sacred Heart Devotion. I'm going to fast forward now to uh, the future work that we're doing. Everyone has probably heard of the Shroud of Turin. You've probably heard more people saying it's a fraud than it's for real. Well, let me tell you, there's so much going for it to be real, I wouldn't listen to those who say it's going to be a fraud. But I honestly believe that one of the final means of verification of the authenticity of the shroud will be in the examination of the blood. On that shroud is not only an image, 
uh, but also blood, and it's real blood. It's blood from a person who's suffered. There's a lot that can be said scientifically about that should be the blood on the shroud. There you see the image of the shroud, the photograph when it was taken, when photography was, was first invented, which revealed a hidden secret about uh, what was lay in, in the in, in, the information that lay in the um, the in the cloth that wasn't visible until photography was invented. I think in the same way, the blood on the shroud will be like a time capsule that will, when science develops, as you see now it's happening with the examination of blood, that it will be able to be the final um, uh, determinant of the authenticity of the shroud. Now, if you look on the screen on the top right hand scene, that's the Eucharistic miracle of Argentina. You see those white blood cells I was telling you about. And you also remember me saying to you about how great modern science is that can look at a cell and inside it there's a world of its own, how great it is. It's something that you know, 20 years ago, 30 years could never have been anticipated. Well, inside that cell is information and the, when you do a DNA test to determine your profile, you find in the nucleus the information which is the contribution from your mother and your father and that is the, the code, the resultant code is yours. The question is why is it we can't get a profile, a genetic profile from the nucleus of the cell here? And one explanation may well be that if we did get a genetic code from this blood, it would mean that there is a profile that's been exhibited that's been produced by a mother and father in union. And I think it would be unlikely that God would allow science to finally confirm through science that Jesus was not born of a virgin. So it may be good news that we can't get a profile. There's more work to be done on that. And the analysis may have to work on the mitochondrial DNA from outside the nucleus. That's another story. But if these stories have happened and it's Eucharist that's produced flesh and blood, we know that it has to be the blood of Jesus. It has to be something. Some, it, must, it must be his blood, particularly if it's human and it's coming in this context in this powerful way. And ultimately I believe that there will be able to be found a match in some form between the blood in that Eucharistic miracle and the blood on the Shroud of Turin. The image down at the bottom is also blood from a, a statue of Christ that cried in Bolivia that we've been studying, which also won't yield the genetic profile of its author. Normally you have a problem of getting a profile from a cell if the cell is dissolved, if it's, if it's, not, if it's, if it's degraded. But the cells in the images there are not degraded. They should have information in it. The fact that we aren't may be indicating this problem. But I'm going to leave you with this nice thought. The consequences if those two bloods match. The blood on the on the right hand side of was the right left hand side on your screen there is the blood from a man who has died. Jesus' blood on his cross from his crucifixion from a dead man. But the blood on the right hand side of the screen is blood the, from the blood from the same person, but now living. The white blood cells show that this is from a living person. So the person who was once dead is now alive in the Eucharist. And isn't that a nice thought to end on?